Welcome back to the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato, and we're recording uh, remote today. And uh, But my colleague and uh, friend, the intrepid Scott Bernstein, is joining us here. Hey, now. And uh, Benny, the engineer, the man behind the glass, is with us. And uh, we couldn't get together in the studio today, but I think uh, we'll, things will go well. And we have a topic today that a lot of people have requested. It's a pretty hot topic, Buffalo Mafia. So before we get into that, just want to remind everyone, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please follow us on social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. We actually do have a TikTok account, but we're not very active on that. But we, we hope to change that soon. But anyhow, anytime you like, subscribe, share, retweet, whatever, it really helps us grow this podcast in a grassroots way. It's really important. We appreciate your kind words and support. Anyhow, Buffalo Mafia, a lot going on. We've actually recorded audio episodes about this topic, but I don't think we've ever focused a video since we started the video channel. And so a lot of people have requested this. A lot going on in the news now, so we'll do a little bit of breaking news, sort of breaking news, but also some historical context for people that are less familiar with what's going on in Buffalo. So... Bernie, you want to start us off with maybe yeah. some of your gangster report stuff, yeah, we, and then we'll we'll unpack it from there. Yeah, we have uh, quite the uh, courtroom drama in the making uh, for the summer of 2023 for the Buffalo mob, the Magadino crime family. It seems like this is um, maybe a, a microcosm in some ways of the net that appears to be at least attempting to be cast by the feds uh, on the Todaro, alleged Todaro mob empire. And uh, the boss of the, the alleged reputed boss of the Buffalo mafia is uh, Big Joe Todaro. He's never been convicted of any felonies, uh, beat a couple federal cases over the years. Uh, and him and his father are, in addition to being alleged mafia dons, uh, are, were, in terms of his dad and him now, are, um, they have a, a pizza and wing empire to go along with their alleged mafia kingdom. The La Nova pizza and wing franchise was started by uh, Lead Pipe Joe Sr. back in the 50s. And they're credited with pioneering the marketing of Buffalo Wings, uh, putting, taking that Western New York delicacy and and spreading it around the country in uh, grocery store freezer aisles. I mean, I can distinctly remember a time when we didn't know what Buffalo Wings were. And then at a certain point in the 90s, uh, all of a sudden, every restaurant you go to, there's BW3s, and it's just a staple now on menus everywhere. But it wasn't before probably the 80s and 90s, and the, the Todaros are responsible for that. But according to the feds, they've also crafted this mafia dynasty in Western New York. Big Joe Todaro always denies any affiliation to the mob. His only real official connection on paper other than allegations was that he was booted out of the labor union about 25, 20, 25 years ago, uh, along with his dad and some other people for their ties to organized crime figures. But uh, his nephew, Peter Geraci Jr., uh, and a retired DEA agent, Joe Bon Giovanni, are going on trial in August in a racketeering drug and prostitution case. Um, And this is one of many cases that have been built uh, either against reputed Todaro lieutenants, reputed Todaro family member slash mob figures, um, his his underboss uh, took a case about five, six years ago where there was a lot of information, al- allegations about him leading that crime family and bringing it back to prominence over the last 
10 years, was in the court filings against Don Violi, who was his alleged underboss. So this, you know, this should be really interesting to see what evidence is going to be rolled out in this case. There's already been a lot of it that has been shown in court filings leading up to the case. That's been about a couple of years in the making to get to, to get to trial. But Peter Geraci Jr. owns Pharaoh's Strip Club, which is the number one uh, gentleman's club in Western New York. <laughs> How many? I wonder what that ranking system is like. <laughs> well, What's I think the number in, two? What's well, <laughs> just in the sense that I think that's when, where I would be hanging out at the number three or Buffalo, fourth. Ranking. When they want to go to the strip club, they go to they go to uh, right. Pharaoh's. <laughs> and okay. uh, Pharaoh's was originally opened by Peter Geraci Sr., who married Joe Todaro's sister. And then at some point in the last 20 or let's say 10, 20 years, uh, Peter Geraci Jr. purchased the strip club from his dad. Was his and dad a, he was obviously a, the brother-in-law, but was he a made guy? Do we know? I, we don't, I, we don't know. Murky, what okay. we know for sure is according to these court filings over the last couple of months, they have witnesses that are going to testify or have testified in front of the grand jury that Geraci Jr., in addition to running the strip club, also running drug rackets, prostitution rackets, and bragging uh, about being a made guy. And then there's this bombshell that silently erupted last week, and it, I, I scratched my head and why this wasn't on the front page of all the newspapers there. And I don't know if it just went under the radar and they're not paying attention because it was in a court, it was kind of dug, it was deep into a court file. But I reported it is that New York or former New York Supreme Court judge, John Mikulski, who committed suicide last year, is an unindicted co-conspirator in this case uh, that's going to trial in August and includes this DEA, retired DEA agent, Joe, uh, Joe Bon Giovanni, who I guess grew up with Geraci and was, according to court filings, informants, has been protecting Buffalo Mafia uh, drug and sex rackets uh, for a decade or so. It's taken over a quarter million dollars in payoffs, according to the prosecutors. So I I'm shocked. But maybe I'm not that that the Mikulski, rev the revelation that Mikulski was an unindicted co-conspirator in this case, and they actually have text messages showing his involvement in the prostitution ring, uh, wasn't covered since his suicide was covered very heavily, and another suicide attempt by him, where he tried to jump in front of a train, uh, was covered pretty extensively, but the fact that he was an unindicted co-conspirator in this case, which came out last week in a court filing, I won't, I'm the only one who's reported it. What do, you, what do you make of that jumping in front of a train? I mean, let, we could, let's get conspiracy-ish for, for a moment to you. Uh, but I guess if someone were going to throw him in front of a train and it didn't kill him, they'd finish him off. They wouldn't, they wouldn't. So he, maybe he did walk, jump in front of a train, but isn't that an unusual yeah. Not that not that we're psychiatrists, but yeah. um, I mean that's an unusual way to commit suicide. Yeah, and then his when he succeeded in committing suicide uh, in, in the spring, I believe it was this it was either the spring or the summer of twenty two. Uh it was within a week or two of the feds raiding his house uh, at the same time that they raided Peter Geraci's house. Do we know how he when he finally when he ultimately killed himself, how he did it? Did he, he shoot him? Yeah, I don't remember. Wild a shotgun, I think. Wow. So, um, in terms of the the details of this case, my understanding is I thought I read somewhere that they're talking about sex trafficking. Mm -hmm. So, does that mean because you can have prostitution rackets where the women are uh, voluntarily? partaking in this and it's still illegal and if you get in tr if you get busted you get busted but sex trafficking to me 
tells me that this these are women forced against their will to be involved in the sex trade. To me, sex. To, uh, maybe we're into semantics here, but to me, sex trafficking sounds more severe than prostitution. Yeah, which could be a kind of voluntary. Even if you think it's, even if you think it's whatever, like you, you don't think it's a good thing. It's not. It's not moral. Or you can even get into certain arguments that that uh, you know women may find themselves in those positions because of other structural forms of discrimination. It's still ultimately a, a, an agreement between two people to to have sex, and if the money is exchanged, you can still make the argument. It's a what would you say? What's the term for it? Um, I mean, victimless agency over your body. Yeah, and, right. And victimless crime. Sex trafficking to me implies something more severe, where there's coercion. Do you have any insight? Into yeah, I think it's what well, I shouldn't say. I think, <laughs> but the um, indictment alleges both uh, traditional prostitution and then you know straight up raw sex trafficking, where they're forcing women. Uh, Applying them with with drugs and, and forcing them to perform uh, sexual acts on on clients, customers. Um, and what, and a, what do we know? The judge, like, how does he get mixed up in with with these? Do, do we know like anything about his bio? Um, off the top of my head, I, I can't give you a ton of bio on on Mikulski other than uh, was an Erie County Supreme Court judge, and Erie County is uh, you know big county up in western New York uh, and th this isn't speculation or hearsay uh, this is text messages and wiretaps um, where he is clearly participating and I think you can kind of Without him here to defend himself, it's. I think there's a, a, a multitude of ways you can look at it when you're dissecting what at least what the feds are showing you in terms of what his alleged participation is, whether it was simply him partaking in prostitutes, uh, or was he feeding the enterprise customers in addition to himself and taking the you know taking finders fees yeah i guess the 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 um the one connection is apparently he was a lawyer for the strip club owner before he became a judge so there is this pre-existing relationship between the two, but I don't know much else about. He was about sixty-one. The judge. He was sixty-one, I believe. Yeah, but he, um, he definitely had ties going to to uh, uh, Gerace, or uh, Ger 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 has, There was like hundreds of texts. Yeah, uh, and, talking and, about uh, getting girls. Yeah, um, and you know he knew this guy, but it, it's interesting how many mainstream people were caught up in this case because you have a obviously a state supreme court justice again not like uh you know some lower court i mean that's pretty fucking big right state yep. supreme court especially the state of new york and then you have a dea agent but there's also a school teacher that's implicated yeah. in this who come no who's pled guilty um who who's according to the government possibly a main member of the buffalo mafia uh who's been teaching in the buffalo public schools uh as well as i think some private Catholic schools um, and coaching football and wrestling. Uh, and he's doing a, seven years in prison right now. And part of his plea was an allocution where he implicates Bon Giovanni uh, in protecting his drug operation and his knowledge that Bon Giovanni was protecting Geraci's, uh operations out of, out of Pharaoh's. I think we buried the lead a little bit, and I want to be sure to put this out there, that Peter Geraci Jr., when this case came down, uh, was out on bond. And in the last couple months, he was violated. Uh, and now he has to finish his wait uh, to get in front of a jury later this summer behind bars 
because according to prosecutors and, and the judge believed this, uh, there was some pretty severe witness tampering going on, witness intimidation. And one of the main witnesses in this case against him, um, we don't know if it's a, a man or a woman, but uh, both, uh, the, both the person who's the witness and that person's mother um, have walked out to their cars in the morning a couple times uh, within the, uh, in their apartment complex. And uh, there are rats, like dead, like live, well, not live, dead, real dead rats that are on their, on their windshield. And the prosecutors put pictures of said dead rats in the court filings uh, last week when we found out that, that Mikulski was a uh, unindicted co-conspirator. Yeah, so that's definitely not a, a good look for, for the defense. We also know, trying to flesh out more of the details here, that there's one count of conspiracy to distribute cocaine. Do we know Do we know what kind of weight? The, in they this were case? moving some serious weight through that club, um, and that's where we see a dovetail with uh, the Outlaw Biker Group, the Outlaws Motorcycle, motorcycle Club. They were not indicted in this case, but my sources are telling me, and, and there's some other reporting that's been done um, out of the Buffalo area, that there's a separate federal investigation going on right now into the Buffalo chapter of the Outlaws. And part of that investigation involves allegations that all of the drug activity being perpetrated, alleged drug activity being perpetrated at Pharaoh's is being supplied by the outlaws. And we have found out through court filings in these cases out of uh, the Buffalo area related to this, it's almost like a shadow attack on Todaro, in my opinion, where you're going after all these people in his orbit without going after him, hoping that, you know, you know, Humpty Dumpty falls and you can't put it back <laughs> together. And it's like, you can take these pieces and, and make a, uh, take a, and use them as a, a legal weapon against Big Joe, um, the reputed boss. But um, it, it's, 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 it's tenuous. I mean, it's, um, it's a situation where you, we know, from these recent court filings that John Armin, uh, who they call Tommy O, isn't just the biggest biker in Western New York right now. He's, according to these court filings that came out in the last couple of years in these cases, he's the, 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 pre, the international president of the outlaws. All the power in that global biker empire is is centered right now in Buffalo, specifically in Pharaohs, where where Tommy O is the head of security. Yeah, well, there we, we're talking about upstate New York, so that obviously is very close to Canada. So maybe just to give some larger context to this, it's interesting they've always had these historical ties, mm -hmm. Buffalo and Canada. For a long time, Hamilton and Toronto were considered part of Magadino's territory, the old man, the undertaker, Stefano Magadino. And then, of course, Montreal was Bonanno territory. And it seems like for a while we thought maybe the Buffalo family was defunct. And as a result, we just assumed that all of the action in ha Hamilton would be independent of Cosa Nostra activities in, in New York. And now we're rethinking all of that, right? Now we think that the Buffalo family is actually not only functional, but, but maybe even thriving. thriving yeah. But, but also as a part of that is that connected directly to activities going on in Hamilton, yeah. especially in terms of the administration, someone yeah. you've already mentioned, so you want to update us on that? Yeah, because let's unpack he's, that. He's, he's on the streets now, I believe. Yeah, both Violi brothers are. Let's unpack that for a second. So I think the seed of the Buffalo Mafia is dead narrative goes back to 
the mid 2000s when Lead Pipe Joe, who there were some guys in between Magadino and Lead Pipe Joe, but really the two preeminent bosses of the Buffalo family um, over the last 50 or last 80, 90 years or whatever, have Magadino and Tadaro. Like I said, there, there was a, some bridge gap guys um, for about 10 years there. But when, when Lead Pipe Joe took over the family in the early 80s, uh, he, he really, he, he was a real power player, uh, not just in his, his crime family, but across the country in terms of respect, in terms of money, big, big time earner, which is where his, his son has gotten a lot of that acumen. Whether you believe he's a criminal or not, these are people that you have to acknowledge their business acumen. They're, they're multi-millionaires a hundred times over because of not, and it's not just the pizza the, in the wings. They own hotels, they own real estate. Uh, I know from my research in Detroit, they were involved. They were actually unindicted co-conspirators in the game tax case in 1996, but took down the whole Detroit mob administration. And some of that stuff had to do with uh, investments in Las Vegas. And back in the 80s, the Chidaro father and son worked with Jack Toko, the, who was the boss of Detroit, in putting the investment together for the Edgewater Casino, uh, where they ended up building and, and stealing about $10 million from it before they sold it. Uh, so these are just really, really accomplished businessmen and alleged accomplished gangsters. But Lead Pipe Joe retires, basically. Big Joe ostensibly takes his place according to some members of, or according to some court records and, and FBI filings. But what, what, what happens next is what I think seeds these, these rumors of, of the, the Buffalo Mafia dying. Lead Pipe Joe's in retirement. Big Joe wants to focus on growing the pizza and wing empire and basically steps down gives the gives the 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 role of godfather to his uh, to lead pipe joe's longtime conciliary lenny falzone and lenny falzone was just he was old i think he was a little disconnected from the street uh and the family floundered under lenny and, and he had trouble i think getting that family to grow, they were stagnating. They, they, there weren't any. There wasn't new blood. The the rackets were very in the nineties, in the eighties, even though it was the late two thousands. That mean yeah. I I don't know about him or Buffalo that that era. Sorry to interrupt you, but yeah, it's good. Ba based on our conversations about places like Detroit, Pittsburgh, he may have been okay with that. Right, we've had. Yeah, I think Lenny, Lenny Falzone was okay with that. I yeah, think. right, right, right. Just letting it sort of like uh, the Sopranos die on the vine. Have, have <laughs> us, you know, gobble up as much money you can as the boss. Yeah, insulate yourself. Yeah, um, and then, according to my reporting, as well as uh, what, what's been put out there in, in court filings over the last decade, it looks like. Big Joe recognized the issue um, and came back, uh, returned to the fold to return the crime family that his father had been at the top of for so long, return it to, to prominence and get it into the 21st century. Uh, and some of that involved new blood. Some of it involved reaffirming and, and uh reconvening their relationship with the five families out of New York City. And some of it involved Hamilton and Canada and and reaffirming and, and reconnecting and reconvening more activity over there. Johnny Papalia had been one of their guys. He'd been dead for 25 years. And they're really, now they've uh, kind of absorbed the Lupino uh, group that had not been under the banner of, of Buffalo, but now is the, 
and, and these are brother-in-law, a brother-in-law of the Violi brothers. And that brings us to Don Violi, who Don and Joey Violi, who's who are mafia princes. Their their dad was uh, gunned down in a mafia war in in Montreal in the late seventies with the Rizzutos, and he took the, the Violis took refuge in in Hamilton um, under the Lupinos. And it, it looks like part of, or a big part of, of Big Big Joe's rejuvenation plan was getting the Violi brothers made. Um, there was debate about where, what family they were going to get made into. This is all, again, this is all in the court filings. This isn't speculation. This was uh, right. put into the record that there was debate amongst the Bananos and the Magadinos, who was going to get the rights to the Violi brothers. Uh, and then in 2015 and 16, Don Violi is, is made in 15. And then Joey Violi, his younger brother, is made in 16. And then in 17, allegedly, Don Violi is up to the underboss post by Joe Todaro at a top secret ceremony in Florida. And there's uh, sourcing that I have, as well as some of this other reporting, that Joe Todaro likes to do most of his talking business in Florida. He doesn't like to talk in Buffalo, business in Buffalo or in his restaurants or, or anywhere that um, he'll, he'll travel, you know, through multiple states to get to a place that he feels comfortable having conversations and, and doing business about his crime family, which is hundreds, if not thousands of miles away. I'm not sure what the drive is from the top of New York down to Florida. Well, yeah, I mean, we, that that's uh, not completely unprecedented. I mean, I, I always go back to Detroit because it's one of the families I'm more familiar with, but at one point, I mean, Joe Zerilli, Black Bill Toco and Pete Licavoli, who were like the, the top three guys, hardly ever stepped foot in Detroit <laughs> toward right. the end of their lives. Pete Licavoli in Arizona and the brother-in-laws, Toko and Zerilli in Florida. Sure. So if, if they needed to weigh in on something, you had to go down there <laughs> and, and talk to them. Um, so, but um, yeah. And, and we also know from, from these investigations of the Violi brothers that they, that they had to clear this with the five families Yes. I think there was even a reference to the commission, which was really well, yeah, and really that they explosive. were do, and they were doing all their communications through a familiar name in our podcast, uh, Mr. Michael Mancuso, uh, who is the boss of the Bananos right now. And Mancuso was in prison, but was communicating through his one of his then conciliaries, uh, Porky Zancocio, uh was was liaisoning with Tadaro, according to these. Uh, court records. Yeah, and I think it's a really interesting discussion just because, I, you know, I like theoretical criminology and I like talking about these things, whether or not the commission exists. And and my sources, in terms of guys who have some, you know, experience in the life, let, it, let us say, it doesn't exist like it used to, like it, in the sense of like the five bosses getting together in a in a restaurant somewhere. I don't think you'll ever see that happen again. So, they used the term, I believe they used the term commission. I have to imagine that he meant it in the very loosest Loose terms, <laughs> very loose, just that yeah. the five families do communicate with each other. We know that yeah. we know the five families do communicate with each other. So in a sort of network kind of way, uh, I, I'm guessing that the that's what filing, he I think meant. the court filing says they got sign off from four of the five families. Yeah. Um, and I don't want to. I'm forgetting on who the one family that that they didn't have sign off from, but um, it appears that Todaro has leveraged his, you know, his and his dad's old connections to New York, um, tap back in, and you know, rumors of the uh, the death of that Magadino organization were quite premature. And although it might have looked like the family was dying in the late 2000s, early 2010s, according to reporting, my reporting, according to reporting in Buffalo, and according to court records, 
um, it's far from the case. And according to, to a wiretap that Don Violi was caught on, there's at least 30 soldiers in this crime family, not counting admin. Um, yeah. And that's a pretty big family for 2000 in the 2020s. Oh, 100 um, percent. I mean, I would say Buffalo was always one of those organizations that its stature and its influence was probably larger than its membership ever was anyhow. Yeah. Right. Um, so that so if they have 30 guys now, it's pretty, pretty remarkable. Um, I would also. Um, I wonder in terms of. The any kind of connection to the violence that's going on in Canada, in not Canada necessarily right now. Montreal, but but yeah. at least we know that there's violence in Hamilton, yeah, Toronto. I want to. Those are traditionally out. Buffalo territories where the Vio, you know, the Violi brothers. That's their backyard. Yeah. So I want to throw this out there, and this has not been. This isn't hard reporting, and I wanted to throw it out there as some stuff that I've heard, and I've not gone to vet it yet, and I I will probably report on it at some point once I properly lock all the specifics down. But as recently as today, I've been getting some sourcing that is telling me exactly what you said, that um, some of what's going on in Canada right now and some of what's been going down in Canada the last five or six years at, at the, I don't even want to say back end of the Canadian mafia work, because who knows where this thing's going and when it will end. But uh, stuff that, you know, this Canadian mafia were started in the 2000s. And I think according to my people by the late 2010s, the Buffalo group was playing some role. And there's some, maybe even with this most recent, uh, Del Basso, uh, Chit Del Basso uh, assassination. Uh, and I'm not saying that Tadaro's had anything to do with it or, you know, Joe Tadaro's guilty of, of ordering a murder, but um, <laughs> well, I always want to be clear, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think, yeah. I, I agree He's with you. Joe Tadaro, again, Joe Tadaro is a, a, according to the, to the law, he is an upstanding member. I mean, according to the official record, he is an upstanding member of society. He does not have any felony convictions. So, yeah. I always want to be clear on that. And he, he adamantly denies that he plays any role in the mob. And I, I want to, you know, anecdotally, I, I reported, I think this is interesting because I love the minutia. He has a, uh, an edict out there since he came back where nobody can say his name. And if they want to refer to him in a conversation, uh, they, they pretend like they're puffing a cigar. Mm. that it's an homage to his father who who addition to lead pipe joe was known as joe cigars and who i guess his dad had implemented a similar no name uh no name spoken edict at, at some point well from from what i can tell i want to come back to the canada thing but just yeah. for a moment with tadaro since to digress for a moment about from what I can tell, his his attitude is different than like Jack Toko, who who would get really uptight if his name was mentioned with anything like mob related, Cosa Nostra. And in fact, he might even threaten to sue you. Yeah, if his, no, if he would. Was... He had twelve. There were twelve separate lawsuits that Jack Toko filed against media uh, outlets over the years until he was convicted. Right, and so. Even though, even though his, even though his name, even though he, he may not have been convicted of anything prior to that, his name was in congressional hearings and congressional investigations. So his, his name, he was on public record as as someone involved in Cosa Nostra. So yeah. I, I'm not sure what he, what he was, <laughs> how, how he. But to your point, could, Joe Tudaro has a different approach, and he right, kind of right. makes fun of it. Yes, in a that's way. where like I was going. Right, jovial about it. Yeah, like, come on, you've watched too many yeah, movies. You're watching I'm too the, many Godfather movies. I'm, right, I'm the pizza and wings guy. Like, get out of here. As if I would, you know. And he's even said, I'm I'm way too busy yeah. running this pizza and wing empire to be involved in any any shenanigans like that. Like, get out and of here. And that does pass the eye test if you talk to people that are in Buffalo. That yeah, you can find him daily behind the counter at a lot of his restaurants, you know, 
being a very hands-on owner. He's not an absentee like corporate yeah. overlord or something like that. It doesn't and seem he's very, like that. He seems very affable. Uh, yeah. Approachable, likable. Um, he doesn't come off scary. I think his dad came off a little scary. Yeah. Uh, he's a popular guy. I mean, people yeah. seem to really like him, That at least that I can tell. And let's point out, it, we can go down a whole rabbit hole about why things don't get reported and how certain things are just accepted. And I scratch my head about it. He has business affiliations, official sponsorships with not just the NHL, but the NFL. So he's been vetted by those two professional sports leagues. You know, when you're in Buffalo, the official pizza and wings of the Buffalo Sabres and the Buffalo Bills are Lenovo pizza. Yeah, that's big. That's big business. Um, uh, but I would say where, where things could be connected to Canada, going back to the violence, is yeah. because I I'm skeptical that. I mean, with all due re with respect to your sources, I I'm skeptical that Buffalo has anything to do with Montreal. I I would I would glad you know admit I'm wrong if that if that comes out, but um, where I think it's connected is more indirectly is that. The Rizzutos kept that whole region in check. And once that organization destabilized, there were ripple effects across, even as far as Vancouver, let alone in Ontario. As far, or, as, far as Italy, as far as Italy, as yeah. far as Mexico. So, South America, right. So, yeah. so that opened up things in Hamilton uh, for the, the Musitanos and the Lupinos to kind of go, go back at it again. And we know that there were, you know, there were killing, you know, murders down there. And so that's where I think it's it's more of an indirect connection to, to Montreal, where the whole region became destabilized. And then this provided an opportunity for Buffalo to kind of reassert mm -hmm. itself. I, I think that's a possibility. Again, to your point, I, I'm not comfortable coming out here saying 100 percent that that's what happened. But there are certainly some signs that that that's what what is going on. And there are, there are just droves of little information nuggets that are in these court documents that have trickled out online over the last couple of years as we've been waiting for this Geraci Bon Giovanni case to um, get in front of the jury. And it's pretty disturbing, some of the stuff that you're – that you're con that you're consuming in these court filings um the 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 work conditions at at pharaohs the the work environment the uh, according to these they had something like 12 to 15 uh either witnesses or confidential informants quoted in this where the uh the drug use and, and the, the drug trafficking just rampant and being used as leverage over employees um where now again i, I want to be clear with um you know where where geraci stands legally there had been a couple of of searches of his person and some vacation property i believe where they had it they thought they had on good authority that he was he had large amounts of drugs on him for sale. Um, and these were uh, unsuccessful uh, searches. So that will go on the rack, that will go into the record that they're, in addition to the searches that they made where they found stuff, there were other searches where they were looking for specific things that they didn't find based on sources that had been previously reliable. And then there's the relationship between, not just between Mikulski and Geraci, but between Geraci and Bon Giovanni, you know, there, there's one alleged situation where a girl, a, a stripper, uh, overdosed at the club, and uh, he needed help getting rid of the body, and he possibly, according to informants and some of the allegations, uh, he called Bon Giovanni, and, and Bon Giovanni uh, helped, uh, I guess 
separate Jurassic and Pharaohs from this dead stripper. Yeah, it's. I, I mean, I don't know all the details of this of this specific case, but just in general, yeah. the the strip club industry is can be pretty sketchy. And again, I, I you know, there's an interesting debate between this idea of like agency over your body is this a, is this voluntary exchange if people want to go to a strip club and a, a, a person agrees to dance there for money it should that be anyone's business uh from a libertarian perspective the answer is no and 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 politically that's sort of where i lean like like grow i think grown ass adults should be left alone if they want to do drugs go to strip clubs whatever listen to the kind of music they want Whatever that tends to be my position, not to get too political here, but I think we should basically leave people alone. Um, but if it, in that industry we know the same thing with pornography, there becomes a fine line because then we find out that some of the people who work in this industry, it's a little bit more of a gray area than just oh, this is my agency and I, and I'm I'm volunteering, you know, to to do this, especially if you're talking about like human trafficking, um, but also when the studios or the strip clubs use like coercive techniques to keep the women in a situation where they actually end up having very little agency. So, I mean, we could do a whole episode on that, but I, I, I do think that, that there are some gray areas here when we talk about either pornography or, or strip clubs. And I, and I want to be clear, I'm not like a, a Puritan, like, Oh, you know, ban pornography or shut down strip clubs because again i think i think adults should should be left alone as long as no one's getting hurt and i think that's that's the debate here is well if people are getting hurt then that then that i think that changes the the formula and, and the calculation about if, if the authorities have a responsibility and, to intervene and let's make no mistake about it at, at, let's, as we wrap up the last 10 15 minutes of this what the end goal for the federal government is here. They want to squeeze Geraci Jr. specifically to have him flip on his uncle. That that's the end game. And I don't really think there's any debate about what the end game is. I would think so. so I, 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 I want to ask you something else though, theoretical. Um there are still we've I think we've talked about this on some of our audio versions, but not on video yet. There are still skeptics out there that think that 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 the Buffalo Mafia yeah. is defunct, that this doesn't prove anything. And part of it is the semantics argument that in these court filings, when you look at the public documentation, it's it's an interesting phrasing. They talk about Italian organized crime, but they don't use the M word. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I wonder from your from your perspective is a an uh, a reporter, but also someone who has a law degree. What do you make of the semantics here of not just coming out and saying mafia family? It's kind of curious. I think it? a lot of it has to do with who they believe is the godfather of the mafia there. Uh, mm. If it was a hardened, convicted, multiple time convicted felon who had done 20 years in prison for racketeering and had been connected to a bunch of murders you're not talking about Philadelphia by any chance, right. are you? <laughs> so, you know, with a guy like Tadaro, again, you mentioned it with Jack Tocco here. Until 1998, when Jack Tocco was convicted in Detroit of, of being the boss of the Detroit Mafia in Rico, he had been boss for almost 20 years, and the media around here had to tiptoe around it um, because of the litigious nature of, of Tocco. Now, Tadaro hasn't shown in history as being litigious but i'm sure there are a lot of media outlets as well as you know businesses that that don't want to roll the dice on that yeah um and a they don't want to put themselves you know give themselves legal exposure but b they don't want to alienate themselves from a, a, a an upper echelon member of the community there godfather or no godfather no that's right that that he, right that the legitimate side of his his world is very influential and and as you pointed out and so i can imagine that the m word would some people in that community might find very alienating <laughs> so well, there's some the prosecutors are sort of trying to be very careful in how they frame this you know there was a i don't want to go too far down this rabbit hole but 
you know, there was a murder in 2007. Now that was 16 years ago, but um, that was at a time when the reports were that the mafia in Buffalo was, was dead and gone. And um, the guy's name was Monty Massimi, I believe, Massimini, Massimi. And uh, he was killed in a gangland styled hit. The guy that killed him was uh, arrested and convicted, I believe. But there were a lot of people whose names came up in court filings related to this Monty guy who was a wholesale drug dealer, uh, had done, I think, 10 years in federal prison, had come out, had started moving again, moving weight again. And some of the names of some of the people that were involved in some of these operations that this Monty guy was involved in had ties to the Todaro family. Now, again, not saying that Big Joe Todaro had anything to do with this Monty guy's murder back in 07, but just another example of how there are so many layers here in, in Buffalo, similar to Detroit, where the leaders of this group in, in, in Western New York seem to be very adept at insulate, insulating themselves from what's actually going on down on the street. It, it, that in, in some families, there's, there's one layer or two layers. It looks like with Buffalo, there might be 10 layers. But according to the feds, once you get to that 10th layer, it's leading back to Big Joe Tadar. Well, yeah, when you say the family, I mean, I, I, a lot of times I use the term organization because people yeah. get confused about, uh, you were talking about genealogy versus, but when you say the Tadaro family, you're, you're, you're talking about the Magadino well, also crime about, organization. No, but I'm also talking about the Tadaro father and son had some connections to some of the people uh, that were in this drug operation. Specifically, one guy that had some some pretty deep connections to the Chitaros. Now, that doesn't mean that the Chitaros were benefiting or knew anything about this drug operation that was going on in the 2000s. It just means one of the people that was allegedly involved in that drug operation, um, it wasn't that hard to connect to, to the two Joe Chitaros. Well, another thing that's interesting from all of this, just at a macro level, is, again, how many uh, Cosa Nostra guys are involved in narcotics, I think. Yeah, that's... I mean, it, it's so common now to see these guys pinched. We've done episodes about, or you've done reporting guys from Philly, from Genovese family. I mean, this is, for, I mean, this is it was always the, the big, you know, the... The, the what do you call it the um, worst kept secret in, in terms of what was going on between prohibition in the 70s and 80s but you know since the drug rush in the mob in the 70s with the heroin um it's just i just think it's it's a staple now in every in every family and it's not really even hidden anymore now it, it had been hidden but I would guess in the last 40 years, as a general rule, if there was any hiding, it was simply pageantry, pomp, pomp and circumstance. I agree with that. I think it goes back to the the Godfather myth. Yeah, I think that's where a lot of that 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 starts um, and it's, from. Yeah, go ahead. And especially, and again, I don't. We could go down this rabbit hole, and I don't want to go down it. But believe me, if you think that this trend around the country with marijuana legalization, if you think that La Cosa Nostra doesn't have involvement at all levels of the legal marijuana industry in all these states, you're fooling yourselves. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, that's just a little bit of involvement. Right. And and the the scale is so large that it's not to say that because people will are going to take your words out of context to people that criticize you online. You're not saying that every single operation has Cosa Nostra fingers on no, 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 it. You're right. saying that Cosa Nostra has its fingerprints on a lot of 
yeah. the 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 operations, and those aren't those not are even necessarily. Lo- I don't even want to say necessarily. I mean, yes, La Cosa Nostra, but I would cast a wider net and just say organized crime. Oh yeah, yeah. And at, yeah, at any level so. with any ethnic group, they yeah. I think they're all they've all been on a um on a mad uh you know like like a a, a a snowball that picks up momentum the further you go down the hill they're they're trying to crash in to the legal marijuana industry because they they they, they wrote they wrote the, the the blueprint on how to do it illegally a lot yeah. of these guys they want to benefit from the legal aspect of it now well, and they and they weren't able to do that with booze, and they weren't able to do right. that really with the, the casinos now. So <laughs> maybe they can uh, get in and on just, it with marijuana. And just like when they, just like in the early days of Vegas, they don't need a license. They just need to have somebody that can get a license, get yeah. somebody licensed that becomes your front, and that's the person that has the license to grow. That's the person that has the license to distribute. Well, who's that person? Who's where's that person getting their money from? Yeah. Um, and we know that there's a, a big case investigation going on in, in New England with uh, linking narcotics and Cosa Nostra. We, we yeah. actually were going to talk about that today and, and some things didn't go according to schedule. So that audiences can can look for that in the future. Um, you, you may uh, you may do that one solo. We may do it together. We haven't figured that out yet. But but that's on the horizon is a is an episode about the same topic with uh, what's going on in Providence. Just to close it down, Jimmy, let's both sit here and you know put our uh, wizard hats on. What's what's in the future for for Big Joe Todaro Jr.? Do you think that in five years from now, when he's eighty years old or uh, getting into his eighties, is he has he taken a case, or are we sitting here in five years from now and he's still squeaky clean and all of this has been you know kind of for naught? I predict that he will not be he will not face any legal consequences. I think if if his nephew is convicted, if he keeps quiet, um I I think that some of these smaller families seem to do a better job of guys keeping quiet and and, and doing their time, especially a relative. But I will um, I will point out I don't know the exact number, but in addition to Peter Geraci Jr., his brother, and uh, I believe is Anthony Geraci, also uh, took a drug case. And there has been three, four, five other Buffalo mob affiliate or alleged mob affiliates that have taken cases over the last couple of years. And that's why I'm, I'm saying that they're, they're um, the feds are are taking that Humpty Dumpty approach where they're just like chipping away yeah. on the margins, hoping to get to the center. Yeah. It seems, um, seems so for sure. So that's to me, it's, it's clear as day that that's, that's the plan. That's the government's plan. Now, whether the plan works it, it, it is yet to be seen, but I just want to be clear that whether or not Geraci flips on his uncle, that seems to be the, the, the one they could get the most meat off the bone on. But what if you know some of these other um, lesser figures could decide to turn, and then their turning could lead to someone bigger turning, and that could lead to Tadaro? I, I don't know. It just seems like there's a lot of cases and a lot of resources being put into that region by the feds, and everybody that they're targeting has some direct connection or or one person removed connection to Tadar. Well, I think it would have to be something catastrophic like like Sal Vitale or Gravano flipping. I I really I really don't see it happening if it's a guy who's like one or two degrees away. And I and I'm so cynical. This is just this is just my intuition. I'm so cynical, but the, the whole point of being infiltrating the legitimate economy and having connections to people in the state Supreme Court and DEA and mainstream society is to insulate yourself. 
And and so I'm so cynical. I think that that that's the whole point. And so when you're insulated, you 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 you, know, you don't take the fall. But I realize that the feds certainly have a concerted effort here to chip away at those not just gangster alleged associations, but these mainstream, you know, these mainstream connections. So I point well taken, but I I'm I, I don't think so. That that would be my prediction. I think he, I, he skates. If you know, I'm gonna just you know, put my uh, two, two cents in. I don't foresee uh, a Tadaro Jr. bust in the no. future as well. I think that the FBI is, is giving it the good old college try <laughs> and the DEA and the ATF and, and uh, Homeland Security. It, it definitely looks like this isn't a half-ass effort or um, as, you know, my one of, my, uh, one of the guys I pay homage to, George Anastasia, who uh, coined the term racketeering light. Um, <laughs> it looks like they're, they're coming with a full arsenal, uh, but this is, this target might just be too big uh, to take down because of everything you just said. That's, that's why he's been able to, or him, or I shouldn't say him, but that's why his nephew has allegedly been able to, to um, get, get his hooks into a, a, a state Supreme court judge, uh, D, a DEA agent is to to have that type of uh, protection and, and insulation from busts. Yeah, I, it's invaluable for a crime boss. Yeah, and it and if and believe me, with a target like that, whether there could be very well intentioned Buffalo feds that are desperate to bring a case, but the the, the Justice Department in Washington with a potential defendant or a top defendant like Joe Todaro Jr., you're going to have to get their sign off. And the bar that you're going to have to meet, yes, the threshold that you're going to have to meet of not just we think he's doing this or this guy related to this guy related to this guy said he's doing this, you're going to need firsthand right. people or wiretaps. And I don't know. If you'll ever get it, and I, I would, if I had to bet, I'd, I'd say no. But it's definitely fascinating to keep keep track of for a, a family that everybody had written off the page is now one of the most you know compelling, fascinating uh, uh, groups in America to, to to keep tabs of. Yeah, I mean, and one thing that doesn't help in terms of the insulation is notice to your point about racketeering light. Notice they're going after narcotics and sex trafficking. I mean, other things, witness tamper. I get it, but but those are the two of the big to the big counts here and that's that will get uh generate less sympathy than the racketeering light oh these guys are running uh local uh craps games and some juice loans you know the average person is like eye roll like really you're gonna go after a 70 80 year old italian dude because of juice loans and craps and games you say sex trafficking and narcotics all of a sudden it's like oh whoa whoa this that that's Maybe we're not so cool with that. And believe me, the prosecutors in August are going to do everything in their power to be able to get in that story about the dead stripper, the OD, the overdose stripper. And I don't know. I, I wish I could speak more authoritatively on it. I don't know what evidence they have or they don't have. But that anecdote, if they're able to get it in front of the jury, speaks volumes. Whether yeah. or not you had anything to do with her death or not, but you come across a, a, a woman that is overdosed, and instead of calling nine one one, you call your alleged corrupt federal government agent to to watch your back. Yeah, and but again, like you said, that that could have been something completely a decision independent of anything organized crime. No, I'm not. I'm not no, no. Yes, I'm not. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that in terms of what you're talking about, optics and yes, what, it doesn't look turn good. a jury against somebody or turn the public against somebody. When you hear stories like that, it, you don't come across sympathetic, whether or not it had anything to do with the mob or anything to do with your drugs or not. Right. Your right, drugs or, right. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a parallel somewhat with Kwame Kilpatrick here, which, which is we talk about bribery and, and, you know, pay for play. A lot of times the average person is like, what? That's complicated. Like, what are we talking about? Like white collar crimes? Like, I don't know. 
But when he talked about Kwame being at this party where there's a stripper who do, who uh, turns up dead and, and there may be some connections, in a lot of ways, that was sort of the beginning of the end for him in terms of public relations. Yeah. Like, even though, by the way, he was never that that's he was never convicted. He was never tried. Never, there's was, never been anyone charged with that. There's never been anyone charged know what we're talking yeah. about in Detroit. We had a mayor named Kwame Kilpatrick uh, back in the 2000s that served two terms. I think so. Um, and in the middle of his second term, he was forced to resign because of a giant scandal related to perjury. Uh, then he uh, was hit with a racketeering case. Uh, and a lot of this was stemmed from a party that he allegedly held to celebrate. The Mansion. <laughs> yeah, as it, we, he was celebrating his victory. He was only 32 years old and he had been elected the, the mayor of Detroit. And he was celebrating his victory at the mayor's mansion. And it was a wild party with uh, allegedly there was a lot of celebrities there. And one of the strippers that was allegedly there, if the party ever took place, because there's a lot of people <laughs> who claim it never actually took place. But one of the strippers that allegedly participated a couple months later was killed. Um, and there's always been a... A, a dark cloud uh, hanging over the Kilpatrick administration because of that party and because of that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, once, once that story broke, even though again, nobody was even charged, let alone convicted, it just became a, uh, you know, what's the cliche, like a bridge too far. It was like pe pe people started bailing yeah. up until that point. People were still standing by him with the, with the racketeering and other charges. People just bail. It was too hot. It was way too hot. And there was the people him. that I've talked to, there was another stripper who ended up dead in Atlanta a month or two after that. That's never been, been, been really reported. The name of the stripper in Detroit that was killed was Tamara Green. They called her Strawberry. Strawberry. Yeah. Um, and there was uh, informants that, and this has never been confirmed, but there were informants that say that Strawberry and Kwame's wife got into a physical altercation at the party. Yeah, that was that was publicly reported. Again, yeah. it wasn't confirmed, but that was publicly reported. But and yeah, that Kwame's that. wife had to go to the either Kwame's wife or or Strawberry. I don't remember which one. I think it was Strawberry had to go to the hospital, and there's right. like a hospital report. Right. And uh, yeah, in terms of the idea that she's not the only one, Strawberry, um, I will confirm that. People, Detroit PD people, are aware yeah. of those, and, and of those rumors. That's all. That's all. I'm and saying. some of it is like, or what I've heard is, and then this we're going down a rabbit hole. We'll be done in this in a second. But uh, <laughs> yeah. what I've heard is that Kwame might not have even known what these people were doing, but they were doing it on his behalf, and it was probably if if anything was done, uh, all allegations that have never been uh, confirmed, but. That you know, these were possibly people that were doing things to clean up Kwame's mess, but Kwame had no direct knowledge of the the dirt that was being done to protect the the kingdom that was the Kilpatrick uh, political kingdom that came falling down and has never recovered. He got pardoned by Donald Trump, though, uh, twenty eight year sentence that he did seven years of, and now he's out and uh, owes the city a million dollars and that the city will never see. Never I, see I can it. predict that. I can predict that too. The oh, city will never sick. see that. It, it, it is, it is gross. And let me, it has, and ugh, I don't, I just want to, it drives me crazy when people try to paint that as a, a racial situation. That was, this guy was, no matter what race he was, this guy was as corrupt as corrupt can be. Well, and nobody, yeah. nobody takes up for him. I mean, he was the, he, he's very unpopular in the city of Detroit and the city of Detroit is majority black city. But he so, still plays the race card to this day. Yeah, he but I don't think anyone. Really, I don't that think he got railroaded reason. because the uh, that he, people in Detroit couldn't handle a powerful black man. And I'm like, dude, anybody in your situation would have got brought down on a Rico. You were you were shaking everybody down. Your dad was shaking everybody down. Yeah, he All was. Right. He was a bad. He was a bad. <laughs> Five guy. minutes on Detroit politics. Uh, this was fun. Um, we'll we'll. Uh, Definitely keep an eye out what's going on in Buffalo. I want to have uh, a, a Buffalo guest on in the next month or two, uh, either a former um, affiliate or a reporter 
or a, an ex uh, law enforcement. So I'm talking to a bunch of different people and I'm hoping that, that we'll get one of them and we'll get their uh, insight from, you know, ground zero. All right. Thanks everyone for listening. Please follow, subscribe, and we'll see you guys soon. We're out.